James, welcome to the show. Hi, Donna. You have to forgive me. I sound a bit like Mercedes McCambridge today because I've got uh, summer allergies. Okay. Mercedes McCambridge. That's something for people to look up if they don't know who she is. <laughs> well, she was in Johnny Guitar, yes. which, of course, is one of the great films of all time and was well-loved, of course, by uh, Jean-Pierre Melville. So there's a connection there. Oh, true, true. And he has a connection with so many um, directors, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe by way of introduction, you can um, explain to our listeners why you say in your essay, um, in your write-up about uh, Jean-Pierre Melville, why you say that that he is um, the French connection, the central nexus between American and French cinema. Sure. Well, yeah. he was a huge uh, Americanophile. You know, there, there, there's this whole anti-American cinema tradition uh, in French cinema. French cinema has often presented itself in opposition to Hollywood. And, of course, the French New Wave, who um, were very influenced and inspired by Jean-Pierre Melville, he came before them, but they loved his films. They loved his independence. He had his own production company, which was very unusual at the time. Um, but they always had this conflicted relationship with American cinema. They loved the American uh, individual films, individual directors, but at the same time always took this anti-Hollywood stance. And so it was a complete and utter paradox. He didn't. He was once asked, okay, who are some of your favorite American directors? And he rolled off over a hundred and some uh, names of silent American film directors, many of whom I've never heard of. I mean, he had this incredible knowledge and love of um, American cinema. And you have to remember that this is long before, long decades before video or any other way of watching films. He was seeing these films uh, in the in the cinemas. Um, so he uh, actually exaggerated his love of American culture. He wore Ray-Bans and he wore big Stetson hats and drove a Cadillac. And in fact, his name is not Melville. Uh, and and we shouldn't give it a French uh, accent like Melville or anything like that. It's Melville because it's taken from the uh, great American novelist Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. Um, his uh, real name was Grumbach. He was uh, Jewish, which is very important uh, when you look at uh, his role, for instance, in um, the French Resistance in World War II, which shaped uh, a lot of his early cinema, the first two films uh, in particular are set um, during World War II, Le Silence de la Mer and uh, Léon Marin Prêtre, uh, Léon Marin Priest. So that's uh, part of his uh, connection to American culture is all of that having an influence on him. But he returned the favor because his films then became uh, a huge uh, influence on a whole uh, group of uh, cineasts, of directors in, in American cinema. Quentin Tarantino, hugely influenced uh, in a film like Reservoir Dogs, um, Walter Hill, uh, his film The Driver is kind of a remake of a, a Melville film. Uh, Martin Scorsese has repeatedly both paid homage to him in his films and also uh, spoken glowingly about. Uh, he's not American, but John Woo was a uh, uh, considered Melville a god. So you have this two-way traffic of influence uh, between Melville and the American cinema. Now, talk to me about his importance to uh, to French cinema, because uh, he's sort of um, at the forefront of the French New Wave, but is he actually of the French New Wave? No, he isn't. He's, in a way, the father or the instigator of the French New Wave, and of course, uh, Godard, in his very first film, Abu de Souf, The Breathless, I mean, first feature, I should say, uh, paid great homage to him by having him uh, give him a huge, it's not even a cameo, you call it a guest appearance, as Parvalescu, a, um, a, uh, a famous author that uh, Gene Seberg interviews in this one long sequence. Um, as uh, Melville became um, 
Well, just to say that the the French New Wave, as I've already mentioned, they admired his independence, but they also admired the fact that um, he was movie mad, that uh, they could see in his, even his early films, um, references to other cinema, which is, of course, a, a whole technique uh, technique or method they used, uh, Godard especially, paying homage to films he loved. Um, but they came to not exactly turn against him, but they became, uh, they fell out of love, shall we say, with him as he became more successful. And it's really amazing to see that some of his films uh, were huge box office successes in France. They were sort of blockbusters of their of their day. Um, when you look at them, because uh, his style is very terse and laconic, um, there's not a great deal of romance, romantic uh, relationships in his film. It's largely um, a, a very male world. Women appear, especially in his later films uh, from the 60s onwards. Uh, there are some major exceptions here, but uh, they, you know they appear in minor roles in in passing scenes. I mean, even in his very last film, Un Flic, it has Catherine Deneuve, you know, one of the great stars of French cinema, but she has a relatively minor role in the film compared to the rela- relationship between the two men, the two men who share her. And um, there's been a lot of commentary about Melville cinema. He was heterosexual, and he was married for decades and uh, to a, a, a woman he he loved and esteemed, and she had a, a huge role in his uh, the whole process of his filmmaking. Um, but many critics of his cinema have characterized it as homophilic, meaning that the most intense relationships the strongest bonds, and indeed, in some cases, the love is between the male figures in his films. Um, His films are all about codes of honor, codes of gallantry amongst people in the underworld. And the underworld, uh, not just in the criminal underworld, but for instance, in maybe his most famous film, which was re-released last decade and became a huge hit, and sells out every time we show it, Army of Shadows, which draws on his experience in the French Resistance. It's it's all about codes of honor, who you can trust, who you can't trust, um, the the, the deadly traps uh, that people lay for each other uh, in in, uh, those years where uh, you, you didn't know if somebody was going to turn out to be a collaborator or not. And uh, you've called this retrospective Army of Shadows. Yeah, uh, simply for that reason. I mean, that's a pure marketing hook, I have to admit. Um, it's It's not meant to have metaphoric meaning about his, I mean, his is a very shadowy world, for sure. Uh, you know his his favorite time of day um, is uh, his favorite time of day, and then I say it's night. It's night. His fi- favorite uh, time is sort of late night and early morning. You know there are a lot of very atmospheric shots of Paris and uh, places around Paris. Uh, in in you know around dawn, uh, he's he's a, a night hawk. So there is that very. Um, materialist meaning of, of uh, shadows, but because the film is so famous and so celebrated, um, that, that's essentially why I, I chose that as a title. I should mention that the reason this retrospective exists, and it is, um, by the way, touring through North America right now, we're uh, one of the stops that started in New York a couple of months ago, is that it's his centenary. And so the French have made a number of new digital uh, uh, copies of his films. Um, so there's only one one single one of his features, um, the rarest, and it's actually the most homophilic of his films. I've only ever seen it in a very rare print with Swedish subtitles, uh, in which Jean Bel, uh, Paul Belmondo plays a uh, bodyguard. That's the only one that's missing from the retrospective. Interesting. Um, so Army of Shadows, uh, the name, uh, to me, suits because of uh, the look of his film. Can You're you right. tell me about um, his cinematographer? 
I, I don't know a great deal about the cinematographer. Uh, I mean, he, he was a famous, a uh, favorite cinematographer of the French New Wave. They shared him. They came to admire his work through Melville and then uh, use him uh, a great deal. Um, Henri Decay, and it's extremely um, moody, black and white cinema in the early years, um, almost expressionistic, almost looking back to German expressionism. In, in he used. Um, Hollywood tricks uh, like the hard wipe, what is called the hard wipe, where an image is uh, wiped literally off the screen, is pushed aside like a scroll. Um, and he used a lot of high contrast, for instance, in Bob Le Flambeur, you get almost a checkerboard like effect of, of, of black and white. Now, when Melville finally arrived at color, it was almost as if he was reluctant to let black and white go because you often find in his late films um, an almost monochromatic uh, grisaille or, or, or um, desaturated quality to the color, the sort of an ashen quality. Even in a film that takes the, the, the uh, title, The Red Circle, there is this, this, this kind of muted color. Yes, and as you said, the, the title is ironic because it's not, uh, you know, sunny by any means. No, no, absolutely not. You know, one of the things about, I mean, you know, you think of the Red Circle. Um, he, one of the things that is rarely said about Melville is that he was a very great director of actors. There are all kinds of splendid performances in his cinema. I mean, think of Simone Signoret, um, who just gives a heart-wrenching performance in Army of Shadows. It's one of her greatest performances, actually. Um, and, you know, I don't want to talk about it more because it would be a real spoiler. The film is extremely suspenseful and ends very shockingly. Um, but, uh, you know, he gave Yves Montand uh, an absolutely fantastic um, uh, role in, in The Red Circle. And, you know, the, 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 to go back to the cinematography, Henri Decay's uh, cinematography in that is is um, very steely. There's a steely quality to the muted uh, color in it. But Yves Montand uh, plays this alcoholic um, shooter, uh, a marksman, who uh, this group that's planning a jewelry store heist uh, bring into the group, despite the fact that his alcoholism uh, will endanger them or can endanger them. And there's this incredible sequence where um, he has this uh, de delirium tremens. And uh, there's, there's this swarm of rats and spiders, etc. And then, you know, a few minutes later, <laughs> Melville has him you know, cool and 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 decked out in a in a tuxedo, um, you know, using his uh, expertise, his precise expertise as a as a marksman. And uh, male costumes were very important to him. In oh, terms absolutely. In of the fit of the the jackets, the uh, the trench coats, the hats. In fact, I'm told by my uh, great colleague, Susan Oxtoby, who used to be here at the Cinematheque and is now director of the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley, where this retrospective is, is concurrently showing, that uh, their young audience has turned up in a lot of Melville costumes. Um, especially popular, no surprise here, uh, Alain Delon's uh, trench coat and fedora in Le Samurai, which gets a second screening. Uh, we've shown it already, but it's, it's one of his most popular films, so we're showing it a second time towards the end of the retrospective. I mean, uh, he, Alain Delon reminds me, and there's a, a Delon trilogy that, 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 um, that Melville made, uh, starting with Le Samurai and ending with Un Flic. Um, he reminds me in a way of the way Bresson treats certain actors, especially uh, the, the character of Michelle in Pickpocket. He's like a walking semiotic system in, in that trench coat and fedora. Uh, you know, it's the ultimate of cool. Yes, and I think that's, uh, first of all, Alain Delon is beautiful, and you know, you, you put him in anything and he's going to look amazing, but he connects with the audience. You forget because he's so beautiful that he is a really good actor. Yeah, but you take everything off, and he's also um, 
quite deluxe as we do on the cover of our 180 uh, program guide if anybody wants the, to take a look the purple noon <laughs> yes the purple noon <laughs> shot um and I am kind of convinced that's why that film sold out yesterday afternoon. One o'clock <laughs> on a sunny Sunday afternoon, there were dozens of people turned away. Um, and I, I can't pretend, you know, it's, it's, it's a good film for sure, and he's terrific in it. But I, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of convinced that that cover had something to do with it. <laughs> It's a it's a great cover, but um, you mentioned uh, Le Samurai and uh, the, the, the different aspects of it. Why do you think this film um, is still so popular, even with younger and younger audiences? Well, it was uh, had a huge influence on people like Walter Hill and uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder. Uh, Fassbinder paid a, a huge homage to it in one of his early thrillers, uh, Love is Colder Than Death. Um, I think it's, it's, it's pure style. I mean, uh, everything about the film, the way it's so terse and elliptical and um, the way it, it, it again plays that ricochet back and forth with American cinema where he's drawing, Melville is drawing on obviously um, film noir, especially of the 40s and into the 50s. Um, you know, the Humphrey Bogart uh, private eye characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also think, dare I say, that he's drawing on Bresson. And uh, and pickpocket. Now this is a, a real uh, bone of contention with Melville, because he a, a lot of critics characterized, especially his later film, as Bressonian because of its terseness. Um, and its laconic nature, and he bridled at that and said, you know, take a look at Le Silence de la Mer, which is his first film, which uh, was made before Bresson made Diary of a Country Priest, and he says, it is I who influenced Bresson. And when I saw Le Silence de la Mer again uh, this weekend, I thought, yeah, Melville does have something there, truly, because he got there first. But um, to go back to uh, Le Samurai, there's just this um, uh, timeless sense of cool about the film, the way Delon is dressed, the ritualized way in which he moves, uh, the ritualized way in which he dispatches um, the people he kills. Um, you know, it was the, I, one thing I love about the film was that when it was originally released in, in Europe, uh, uh, it was called Ice Cold Angel, referring to, of course, the, uh, the uh, hired killer uh, character that Delon plays. And uh, Melville, you mentioned um, uh, Yves Montand, and we were just talking about Alain Delon, and, but there's also um, Jean-Paul Belmondo, who's a part of this sort of gang of men yeah. that uh, Melville also yeah. always worked with. Yeah, and again, this is the two-way street with, um, obviously, um, uh, the French New Wave, because uh, Belmondo, of course, was a, a favorite actor of, of Godard. <laughs> I mean, Breathless sort of made his name. Um, I think Belmondo, uh, of course, and the most surprising thing is uh, he plays a priest uh, in, in Léon Morin, Prêtre, or Léon Morin, Priest. Um, uh, a very unusual role for him, but totally, totally convincing. Uh, when I re-saw it yesterday, um, I, I found it extremely moving. Uh, you know, it's the story of a love affair. I'm not a love affair. A would-be love affair between a Catholic priest and a communist uh, woman, who uh, a widow who, who was married to a Jewish man during World War II. And her growing desire for him and his recognizing it and, and actually... I think falling in love with her, but resisting it because of his uh, religious calling. Um, Belmondo, I think, uh, in that film, and the one, as I mentioned, that is not in the retrospective, so I won't go on about it, but um, I think he doesn't uh, fit into the Melville universe quite like people like Alain Delon, partly because he, he, he went for actors who were withholding who were a bit, shall we say, repressed. Uh, Lino Ventura. There's something very laconic, taciturn, withholding 
about uh, his his favorite actors, which suits his cinema, right? I mean, they they kind of embody that quality of his cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to end off, there is um, a film, Jean Pierre Melville, portrait on portrait on uh, Neuf Pose. Yeah, uh, it's it's a lovely film actually. It's um, this this kind of film essay about him, and it's kind of a. Um, uh, introduction to his world. Um, it's made by a, a famous French film uh, historian, Andreas Labart, and um, it it is uh, you know it's called Nine Poses, and it 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 goes through. For instance, uh, the first section is called The Businessman, and it talks about Melville setting up his own studio, and you know this independent studio that he set up was controversial. I mean, it was admired by the French New Wave, but at the same time, it alienated uh, a, a, lo a lot of the French film industry because he tried to be so independent to take control of every aspect of his, of his filmmaking and resist any kind of incursion from the outside. But this meant, in, in many cases, he tried to get around union rules. He tried to get around all kinds of protocols of the French film industry. And so um, his independence wasn't always necessarily admired uh, in France. Now, he died uh, fairly young. I would say 55. Yeah. Where do you think his cinema, would his cinema have survived, do you think? That is a very good question because it was already starting to feel like it was of a previous generation. I mean, I think if you look at his last film, Un Flic, from 1972, uh, you know, 70, the 70s were uh, the great decade of upheaval in, in Hollywood and in American cinema, which then came back and, and caused uh, great changes in, in European cinema. I'm, he's, he was such a classicist in his way that uh, I, I really could not say that um, his cinema would have necessarily changed uh, in the way that you might think in the 70s. Um, I mean, it was an untimely death, for sure. He, uh, I, I, The account that I've read of it, it was that he was actually eating lunch at his favorite brasserie in Paris and just sort of keeled over. Yeah, it's it's a shame that he, he died so young. But in, in terms of the, uh, the film industry, the 70s, I don't think, would have been a good match for him. I, 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 I would tend to agree to, with you. I, yeah. And I, I'm not so sure that he would have had the ability to adjust. Um, no. Because he was a classicist at heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that, um, you know, decades later, you have these young directors who've discovered him that bring him back. Yeah. So if he'd lived maybe at the time, yeah. he would have um, made a cameo in a Tarantino film and people would have said, <laughs> oh, wow. <You> know? Yes. <laughs> it's like, and then he would have had a second wave of a career. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Le deuxième souffle. Oui. Yeah. <laughs> well, James, we still have to talk about um, Panique, uh, the French uh, crime uh, classics. So just hold on the line for like 30 yep. seconds. Absolutely. Station identification. And then we'll be here. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. On the line with me is James Quant, cinema essayist and senior programmer at TIFF Cinema Tech. We're discussing the Summer in France uh, series, and we just wrapped up Army of Shadows, the films of Jean-Pierre Melville. And uh, in 30 seconds or less, we'll be back to talk about Panique, French crime classics. CIUT 89.5 FM, the sound of your city. Celebrating 30 years on the FM dial. Stream CIUT or listen to recent shows at www.ciut.fm.
You know, I really could spend um, every day this summer um, at the light box uh, down at King and John um, watching beautiful French uh, classic cinema and uh, just wrapping up Army of Shadows, the films of Jean-Pierre Melville. Um, we're moving on now to uh, Panique, French crime classics. And joining me on the line is James Quant of TIFF Cinematheque. So, James, uh, Panique um, sounds thrilling with all these femme fatales and, you know, dangerous people. And uh, there's a film screening uh, tomorrow night, and I want to mention it because it's one of my, uh, one of my favorites. Oh, actually. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. This is one of my perverse pleasures. And, um, you know, I have to say that a, a very interesting thing about it. We, let's give the title, Mademoiselle. And uh, uh, it's made by an Englishman, Tony Richardson. And a fascinating thing about it, one of the many fascinating things about it, is that it was shot simultaneously in both French and English, the exact same film. And so Jeanne Moreau um, did her role, uh, the central role, and it's one of her great performances, um, in both languages. And I've seen both versions, and... Um, uh, it probably goes without saying that the French version is seems much more perverse. I'm going to use that phrase that you use, perverse pleasure, <laughs> when I'm talking about it uh, is. certain it films, is. because mean, it's this, really twisted. Well, this it's a script by uh, Jean Genet, so of course you have to expect uh, a, a lot of blasphemy, which there is. Uh, it's a, a totally depraved performance by, by Moreau. She plays Mademoiselle, uh, who's this quiet, dignified little uh, uh, a school teacher in a, a little a rural French village? And what uh, the townspeople don't realize is that um, she gets her sexual kicks from all kinds of things. Uh, she loves disciplining her schoolboys. She sneaks out to create. Uh, all kinds of mayhem in the countryside, floods. She is, um, uh, she dabbles in arson, etc. And then uh, her sexual uh, fascination and energies become focused on a, uh, a strapping Italian, uh, Italian uh, itinerant worker uh, who's working in the fields. Now, at this point, what I would love to do, but it would lose your uh, license immediately, is to quote um, Patti Smith's very famous, she wrote a, 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 an encomium, a paean to the film, which she greatly loves, uh, which is absolutely great. I would just suggest to people, look it up, Google it immediately, because uh, if I, I read it out, um, you would be in trouble, as you know. Oh, I'm going to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'll Google Patty Smith and uh, Mademoiselle, yeah, and see what comes up. Yeah, but uh, Jean Moreau rolling around in the fields is just oh my goodness. Well, Patty Smith, that's what she writes about. <laughs> so. Okay. And any film that Patty Smith loves, I mean, you know, she wrote that poem about Bresson's O Hazard Balthazar. So, yeah. uh, you know that that's an automatic uh, recommendation as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So the wretch, this uh, series is called uh, Panique. So yes. let's talk about that title and that film. Okay. Um, it's, uh, to me, uh, a real buried treasure, to use that cliche. I absolutely love this film. I love this director, period, Julien Duvivier. There are a couple of his films in the series. Um, it uh, has a film that's recently been restored and uh, recently had a very long run in, in, in New York City where it was gre greeted as a, a real revelation, which it is. Um, it is... I've been trying to show this film for years and it, uh, it just wasn't uh, available. So um, it is one of the uh, most powerful and assiduous films about mob mentality that you can imagine. It's 1946, so right after the war, and it's hard not to read the film as a kind of commentary on French collaboration, even though it doesn't present itself as such, but certainly that, that metaphoric under, underlay is there. Uh, Michel Simon, one of the great uh, actors of, of classic French cinema, is this kind of reclusive 
withdrawn uh, voyeuristic bachelor who spies on on women from his his uh, garret apartment and there and he he uh he does all these things that kind of start to click into place when he becomes uh, a suspect in the murder of a young woman whose corpse is, is discovered very near to his apartment building because for instance he'll go into the uh boucherie and order a um a uh, is it a lamb chop i don't remember some kind of meat extra bloody and so he comes under suspicion, as I say, for this murder, and the film uh, culminates in one of the most suspenseful and horrifying uh, sequences of, of mob violence, I think, in all cinema. Mm, okay. Now, since we're on Duvivier, let's talk about Deadlier Than the Male. And oh, another one well. of my favorites. Um yeah, I've shown this a, c- a couple of times, and audiences are always knocked out by it. Now, it's a much later film. We're getting towards the end of the 50s. And um, it has, uh, of course, uh, one of the other great dr- uh, actors of French cinema, Jean Gabin, who seems to be in every second film in this series this year. It's almost like a mini Gabin retrospective. Well, his face is made for it. <laughs> yeah, he is. I mean, he's he, he's fantastic in all these uh, Touche pas au Grisby and etc. Um, but he plays a, a restaurateur uh, in Les Halles and it's one of those great films, you know, it'd be made for the for, for a food and film series because there are all kinds of great um, scenes about uh, him buying the, the food in the market and preparing it and scenes in the kitchen etc etc so it's one of those kinds of films but it is an, a noir in that we have a true femme fatale um, who's deadlier than the male um, a young woman who claims to be uh, a daughter of one of his uh, ex-wives and she arrives on his doorstep and all of a sudden, uh, this whole vile world of of betrayal and uh, murder, um, uh, you know, his 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 lovely restaurant turns into this whole, kind of like a, a den of evil because of her incursion. Um, and uh, it's it's extremely atmospheric film. Um, Many will find it misogynist in the way that many noir films are uh, in its portrait of of uh, the femme fatale. But it's uh, you know Gabin is, is is truly great in it. And Le Trou. Le Trou is a film that um, again there's this you know this this cross chatting between the two series because there are many films in this series that uh, influenced Melville or were influenced by him or were admired by him and uh, Le Trou is is one of them um, it again is a film that has recently been restored um, and again had a long run recently in in New York um, it's based on a true story um, uh, about a prison breakout and uh, it focuses in this very, um, shall I say, materialistic way on the, uh, the plans of these uh, half dozen men um, who have to trust each other as they plan this very elaborate uh, breakout. And, uh, you know, I've said already about uh, three other films, <laughs> so I, I have to be careful here. But... Um, it is one of the most um, um, suspenseful films. I mean, you you may grow your nails long because you're going to be chewing them um, throughout the film, uh, and it has a real surprise ending. Uh, when the ending, when the twist happens, shall we say? Uh, every time I've seen the film, you 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 know people cry out in the audience because they're so shocked. Okay. Now, I, I skipped over the other um, Duvivier film, um, Pepe Le Moco. Pepe Le Moco, again, Jean Gabin. Uh, it's earlier than either of the other two. It's 1936. Um, Jean, uh, people who loved it included Jean Cocteau and, and uh, the British novelist Graham Greene, who, who 
called it one of the most exciting and moving films I can remember seeing. I mean, it's it's fascinating that a number of the films here were remade by Hollywood. Um, for instance, um, uh, Purple Noon, which we talked about already, which showed yesterday, was remade um, as the talented Mr. Ripley. And in the case of Pepe Lamoco, it was such a hit that Hollywood uh, remade it not once but twice uh, as Algiers and Casbah. And um, an interesting thing is that um, the producer, uh, Hollywood producer, um, attempted to have all the prints of it destroyed uh, when he made, I think it was Algiers of the two, um, because he just didn't want the evidence of, 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 of the remake and people comparing it because Pepe Lomoco is a far superior film. Anyway, um, Pepe is played by Jean Gabin. He's sort of this natty uh, criminal who's hiding out in, in, in the Casbah. He's, uh, but the yearning for Paris. Um, there's a, a famous scene where he recites uh, all of the names of the, the metro stops in, in Paris as a, as a kind of poem to the city. Uh, and again, another femme fatale. Uh, he falls in love with a very dangerous woman, and it all leads to uh, uh, um, murder, shall we say. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a very exciting thriller. And, uh, you know, the, the studio sets of the Casbah are fantastic. One of the films that's shown now and then at uh, TIFF Cinematheque that I always try to make time to see is um, Eyes Without a Face. Yeah, we've done the Franju retrospective. He's one of the great, great um, mm-hmm. directors. And this, still to my mind, uh, made in 1960, uh, you know, over half a century ago, is still one of the creepiest films um, ever. I actually, <laughs> dare I say it, there's certain sequences that I have a bit of a hard time watching because uh, it in- involves a face transplant. Um, uh, so it's set in this uh, shadowy chateau in the French countryside, and Pierre Brasseur uh, plays this um, unhinged Parisian surgeon who sends his assistant, uh, played by Alida Valley, a, a fantastic um, Italian actress, uh, into Paris to um, stalk beautiful young women that she can kidnap so that he can uh, take their faces and uh, graft them onto the um, face of his beloved daughter, played by Edith Scobb, um, because her face is mutilated. Uh, and it's an extremely surrealist film, full of all this surrealist imagery. Um, and the scenes of Alita Valley stalking the young women in Paris are... are um, truly uh freakish um but the, the 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 scenes more of the of the attempted surgeries uh you know um and the, the title of the film eyes without a face of course refers to the mutilated face of the uh, of the daughter well what creeps me out with that film the dogs <laughs> I yeah. won't get into detail, but yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's uh, the ethereal Edith uh, Scobe and and, yeah. the, and the dogs, dogs and, and well, dogs and doves. Um, yeah, the two animals that are all part of the surrealist uh, lexicon there. Yeah, um, Franju has another film uh, in this series. Um, Jude. Judex? Judex. 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 It's, 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 uh, yeah, it's a uh, hard, hard X on the end. Um, this is, uh, this goes back to the roots of um, French crime cinema. I mean, when you think about it, um, French cinema in the silent period um, began with crime. I mean, they had all these serials like Fantoma and Judex uh, that were hugely, hugely popular. And this is Franju's uh, 1963 homage to that tradition. He takes a character from one of those silent French crime serials, Judex, and uh, turns it into this extremely entertaining and very funny and very haunting. The imagery is incredible. There's a costume ball in it that I swear um, David Lynch had a look at before he made some of his films. Um, people dressed up as, as birds and, and whatnot. Anyway, uh, Judex is played by uh, Channing Pollock, 
and he's a kind of avenger who goes up against uh, a cat-suited woman uh, played by Diana Monti, who's insidious and slinky. And uh, I'm I'm always thinking uh, of the um, now dead great great British film historian and critic Raymond Durniat because um, he always claimed that the way she slunk around in this cat suit uh, signified her lesbianism for some reason. Um, and that makes me think of Melville again because there's this incredible sequence in um, Two Men in Manhattan. Uh, you know, think about it, it's the early 60s, very early 60s, and there's a scene where he, the, the detective is on the track of a, uh, a missing diplomat in Manhattan, and he's quizzing a woman who knew the man, and all of a sudden a naked woman comes out of the bath, uh, bathroom in, wrapped in a, a skimpy towel, and the other woman begins to towel her down and says, I really don't care about the stories of men and women. <laughs> it's incredibly daring. Very. <laughs> anyway, we've gotten off the topic here. Um, yeah, Judex is all, it's, 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 it's great fun. It's all daring do and kind of perverse in its own way. Um, yeah, Franju, uh, you know, it's been a long time since we did that retrospective. It's time for, the, for one again. He's, he's, he's really great. Now you have, um, there's, you were lucky that this respect, retrospective has, um, sorry, this wave has so many restored and archival prints. Well, the, the this is, of course, uh, one of the great things about, you know, uh, me, who's always been committed to 35 millimeter to showing film on film. One of the great benefits of digital, I have to say, is that it sends them back to the labs, it sends them back to the elements, it sends, because there's now all the major festivals in the world, including TIFF, uh, can Venice, uh, they all have major uh, sidebars of restorations, everybody's doing it. And so there have been many done um, for both the Melville series and uh, in this series. I mean, a number have already played, um, but I really would uh, draw attention yet again to Panique, uh, because that film was unavailable for, for so long, and uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty terrific restoration. And I have, I've never seen Port of Shadows. Port of Shadows um, is uh, another digital restoration. Uh, Marcel Carnet, so this comes from a different tradition of French cinema, which is the 1930s, what is known as uh, poetic or fatalistic uh, f um, uh, cinema of that period. Jean Gabin, yet again. Although in this case, uh, the woman is, is not a femme fatale. It takes place in the port city of La Havre. It's very shadowy. It's very moody. It's very it's very filled with fog. Um, he falls in love with a woman called Nelly, played by Michel Morgan, and uh, the villain in this case is uh, a sinister guardian, who uh, played by Michel Simon from Panique, and. Uh, I find the film really troubling on all kinds of levels, uh, as beautiful as it is. It's, it's very much about uh, this sense of fatalistic entrapment, that these people are trapped in uh, a, essentially a, a narrative that they can do nothing to avoid this, this, the tragic tra trajectory of. Now, I would ask anybody who sees the film whether they share... Uh, my disquiet about the character of Michel Simon. Uh, I won't go any further because I don't want to spoil it. I want to keep people's minds open to the interpretation of that character. But um, it's uh, there's one way of reading it that I, I, I certainly uh, enjoin. Uh, it's, 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 there's one way that I, I should say, not enjoy, but enjoin. In other words, I join with that sees his character um, as uh, an anti-Semitic portrait, and uh, it, it's it's one of the disturbing things uh, in, in that film, and I would carry that over to Panique, 
to have people wonder about the character that again Michelle Simon plays in that in that film. Um, it's a, a, a disturbing question. What did you call this genre of film, James? Well, it's called um, poetic realism. Uh, even though it's not really realistic in the sense that they were often, you know, they were studio bound, um, most of the films. It wasn't like neo realism in Italy or anything like that. There's a lot of emphasis on um, set design in these films. Uh, in fact, the great set designer Alexandre Trauner um, became famous through these these films that Marcel Carnet made during that period. Okay, we'll have to talk about that sometime. Anytime. Okay. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much for joining me for the majority of my show today. It's been an extreme pleasure. As always. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. And that was James Quant from TIFF Cinematheque. For more information about the series, the two series that I was talking about today, Army of Shadows, the films of Jean-Pierre Melville, which runs until August 19th, and Panique, French crime film classics, which runs until September 3rd, you can go to www.tiff.net, www.tiff.net. You can also phone for tickets at 416 599 Eight four three three. You're listening to The More the Merrier with Donna G. I'll be back next Monday between 3 and 4 p.m. right here on CIUT 89.5 FM or you can listen via the web www.ciut.fm. Bye-bye.